So welcome once again to our Oxford Brain Diagnostics guest speaker series. Um, by way of uh, introduction to OBD, uh, we're an Oxford University spin out with for analyzing uh, MRI based on cellular structures. And we're working towards a clinical tool for early detection of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which is intended to be used uh, by clinical services and drug developers. And so for today's uh, guest speaker episode, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Risa Sperling, who began her studies at Harvard Medical School and is now Professor in Neurology at Harvard. Uh, she's the director of the Center for Alzheimer's Research and Treatment at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass uh, General Hospital. And uh, Dr. Sperling is uh, the, uh, well, has many honors, but is the co-principal investigator of the Harvard Aging Brain Study, is co-PI of the NIH-funded uh, Alzheimer's Clinical Trial Consortium, ACTC, co-lead for the anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease, the A4 study, uh, and co-lead for the AHEAD 345 study as well. Uh, uh, so I hope Risa will have time to speak about some of those many different uh, studies and pieces of work and her background. Um, uh, and also Risa will be receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award at CTAD this year alongside uh, Keith Johnson. So uh, thank you for joining us, Risa, and uh, over to you for your presentation. Oh, well, thank you so very much for uh, having me. And uh, I'm going to race through a lot of uh, uh, slides, but I hope there'll be time for uh, questions at the end because that's the most exciting part. Next slide. So I um, always like to start with reminding us of what an unmet challenge Alzheimer's disease uh, remains. Of course, it's the most common etiology of uh, late life dementia. And most of my statistics are from the United States where I reside, but I know this is a worldwide problem and very uh, similar uh, statistics in, in Europe. So currently almost 6 million individuals already have a diagnosis of dementia in the United uh, States or suffering from dementia. And uh, because we're doing a pretty good job at keeping people alive longer, we really are creating an epidemic as it's estimated that one out of three uh, seniors will die with dementia. Of course, the cost is uh, tremendous, um, not only in terms of direct care, but also lost work for uh, caregivers. And until recently, which I'll be talking about a bit later, we've had pretty limited success with disease modifying uh, clinical trials. I think a lot of the reason we haven't been as successful in the past is that we've been starting at a relatively late stage of the disease. So in this first part, I'm really going to be talking about how we can detect the changes in the brain more than a decade before people get uh, symptoms and um, ideally start treatment then. Next slide. So this is the way um, I uh, kind of conceptualize it. I'm sure you've seen in other uh, talks something uh, similar, but this is the continuum, the clinical continuum of Alzheimer's disease. And again, we now recognize that dementia is really a pretty late stage of a process that evolves over 20 or 30 years. This uh, earlier stage we call mild cognitive impairment or prodromal Alzheimer's disease in the setting of positive Alzheimer's disease biomarkers um, last for somewhere between five to seven years. And as I'll discuss, I think part of the reason we've started to see some success in trials is we've moved earlier into that stage. But ultimately, I think we need to be treating Alzheimer's disease at a stage we'll call preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And let me um, define that a bit. These are people who have changes of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, the buildup of amyloid plaques, as I'll show you in a minute, and also the beginning of what we call tingles, this uh, form of hyperphosphorylated tau that also builds up in the brain. Now, at the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, these people can't really be distinguished from, quote, normal aging. And I put normal uh, aging in quotes because as I age, there's nothing normal about getting more uh, forgetful. But we all uh, have cognitive changes as we age. And one of the things we work hard on is how can we detect the earliest changes with biomarker, with imaging, and with cognition? Because ideally, we'd like to treat people before they get to the stage of impairment. Next slide, please. So this is actually one of my first uh, uh, slides of a mother nature analogy, which I, I will uh, punctuate this quick talk with. Here's the 
proverbial tip of the iceberg. And I just want to emphasize this because what we see as Alzheimer's disease currently is what's above the surface, people with evident symptoms and uh, uh, dementia. But unfortunately, what's below the surface is what's heading towards us as a society as people come into the age of risk for Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. So the good news is, as I mentioned, that we can now detect Alzheimer's disease pathology during life quite well. Um, on the left is actually what it looks, how Alzheimer's disease pathology looks like under the microscope. Those kind of rounded structures are neuritic plaques, these um, with a little bit of dark around the edge of these uh, circular uh, structures, and that's a little bit of tau um, around the plaques. And of course, the plaques are composed of amyloid beta, mostly uh, amyloid beta 42. This builds up in our uh, brains in a large percentage of uh, people beginning at about age uh, 60. The dark kind of uh, triangular structures with little tails are the tingles, and those are inside nerve cells and neurons. Over on the right, I'm showing you um, a, a picture on the top of amyloid uh, imaging and on the bottom of tau pet uh, imaging. On the left side there, you can see that normal people who don't have much amyloid also don't have much tau buildup or tangles. And on the far right are people who is a person who already has Alzheimer's disease dementia. At that point, they not only have a head full of amyloid shown in all that pink on the top right, but also a substantial amount of tau pathology, these tangles building up. So we've been really focusing on that middle group now, as we define as preclinical Alzheimer's disease. These are people who are still cognitively normal or cognitively unimpaired, that's the CN, but they have evidence of amyloid buildup in their brains, and as I'll show you later, they're already starting to develop tau. Next slide. So we started this work almost 10 years ago when amyloid uh, imaging um, became widely uh, available in the Harvard Aging Brain Study. And we saw that about 30% of people who are clinically normal already have amyloid plaque buildup in their brains. They have it in exactly the same distribution as we see at later stages of Alzheimer's dementia, but not quite uh, up at the highest levels. Next slide. Now this is a build slide that I'll show you. Click one more time. This is what we, this is from my colleagues down under Chris Rowe and Cullen Masters, and I really like this demonstration. So in red is the prevalence of what we call Alzheimer's um, dementia clinically. One more click. In green here is what we've known for a while that people who die who are cognitively normal have a certain likelihood of developing, of having plaques uh, in their brains, even though they still don't have memory symptoms. And you can see this has a very similar exponential curve. It's just translated over. One more click. Now here in blue is the likelihood of being amyloid positive on a PET scan if you're normal, and that maps nearly perfectly onto that autopsy uh, data. One more click. So it's estimated right now that it's about 15 to 18 years between the time you have sufficient buildup of amyloid in your brain and the time that you're likely to get diagnosed with clinical dementia. Well, for me, that's a glass half full. We got 15 years to potentially treat people just like we do in almost every other field of medicine by detecting disease before people come into their um, uh, physician complaining of symptoms. Next slide. So we've started uh, work and I'll show you some from the Harvard Aging Brain Study and ADNI following these people who we characterized with amyloid um, beginning uh, back in um, 2012 or so. Now in blue here is a line of what the people who don't have much amyloid uh, or amyloid negative we call them, and in red is people who are characterized as amyloid positive. Now we're completely blinded as are all of our participants as to whether they have amyloid plaque buildup in their brains or not. But you can see that over time, unfortunately, those who have high amyloid decline, and they decline on all of these tests, or at least show less of a practice effect compared to those who don't have elevated amyloid. Next slide. And very similarly, uh, here is data from ADNI now across uh, 50 sites uh, in the US. 
very similar pattern. Um, in blue is the normal or not having uh, as much uh, amyloid and in orange is the elevated amyloid. And again, you can see that um, at least in the beginning, those with um, not much amyloid show a practice effect and they do decline over 10 years, but at a much a slower rate than those with elevated uh, amyloid. And again, uh, this is here now with CSF, cerebral spinal fluid or PET um, characterization of amyloid. And on the right, I'll just briefly show you, this is what we call the clinical dementia rating scale. This is more of a summary of uh, how people are functioning um, and uh, includes what the study partner says about them. And that takes a little longer to change, about five years before we really see functional changes from the beginning. But nevertheless, unfortunately, by 10 years, a substantial proportion of people with these elevated uh, amyloid at baseline progress to MCI or dementia. Next slide. So uh, one of the questions I often get asked is, well, what predicts what will happen? And I'll, I won't talk too much about genetics today unless people have questions, but um, a lot of Alzheimer's disease is genetically driven primarily by a gene called APOE, and in particular, the APOE4 um, allele. And one of the things we've done, my, one of my colleagues, is really to look at the effects of APOE4 in people who have elevated amyloid um, unfortunately, that combination of APOE and elevated amyloid is particular risk for decline and particularly in women. Next slide. So let me come back to the tau uh, a bit because um, I've been focused on amyloid for much of my career, but now that we can see tau as well in the living brain, I think one of the most important things we can do is try to understand the relationship between these amyloid plaques and the tau tangles as they uh, uh, build up. And this is the slide I showed you before, but I now want to concentrate on that middle group. And what we can see again is in people who are still cognitively normal, um, or at least not yet at the level of impairment, we can see that tau begins to spread from deep in the brain, in the medial temporal lobe, we call it, out into the surrounding cortex. And unfortunately, that's a sign that they are very likely to experience rapid decline. Next slide. So uh, my next uh, mother nature analogy here is unfortunately a forest fire because we don't fully yet understand how amyloid and tau interact, but amyloid appears to act, or at least the situation that relates to amyloid accumulation acts as an accelerant. And we suddenly see this tau spreading even in these normal people uh, who have elevated amyloid. Next slide. So this is some work we published uh, last year. We uh, refer to this as the catastrophe. Sorry for the bad uh, joke, but unfortunately it's not a joke because these individuals, um, when they hit a certain level of amyloid, um, have about three times the risk of suddenly accelerating and having tau bursting and spreading throughout the brain. And these people, again, you can see up in the right-hand corner in red, are people who within two years progress to a stage uh, are being diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. So again, an argument for me that if we're going to intervene at least with an anti-amyloid, we want to be before the catastrophe because I think then tau uh, may take on a life of its own. Next slide. There's also some uh, data that's very supportive of treating with an anti-amyloid earlier that's been, uh, uh, came out last year from the denanumab uh, data. This is a phase two trial of Lilly, but they went back and they brought in people in this study. It's an anti-amyloid decreasing plaque drug, but they looked at who responded on the basis of how much tau they already had in their brain. And it turns out that it was really this lower third of individuals who had relatively limited tau at baseline who showed the best response to this anti-amyloid drug. Again, arguing for earlier treatment. Next slide. So at this point in my talk, I inevitably think that someone out there is thinking and saying, okay, so why would you want to detect Alzheimer's disease and know that somebody's at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia 
10 or 15 years earlier if there's nothing you can do about it. And what's so exciting right now is that maybe there is something we can do about it. And I'm more and more convinced that the way we will be able to do something about it is by treating as early as possible. Next slide. So as I'm sure um, many of your audience members are well aware, we've had a roller coaster of Alzheimer's uh, trial results uh, over the past um, two decades, and even in the past uh, couple of years. And I have to say there's been pretty limited success until very recently in large scale uh, trials. Almost all of the trials so far have been targeting anti-amyloid. And until recently, we've been trying them at mild to moderate dementia, where there's already very substantial neuronal loss, neuronal damage. Um, and one of the things I think we have seen is that as we move earlier to a stage of MCI or very mild dementia, and in particular with more aggressive dosing, that perhaps there's more encouraging uh, recent results. Now, I, oops, sorry, <laughs> stay there for one more second. Um, the, um, Important point though about treating earlier as well is that we don't actually have to cure Alzheimer's disease. What we really need to do is delay the terrible stage of this disease, the dementia stage. And if we could even do that by five years, we would reduce the costs in our country and I'm sure in the National Health Service um, by nearly 50% because the expensive, both emotionally and financially, stage of Alzheimer's disease is of course much uh, later. And this is what we do, as I mentioned, in every other uh, kind of uh, disease where we've had success, cancer and stroke and HIV AIDS, diabetes, um, osteoporosis, we've really made major dents there by treating people before they have symptoms because that's our best chance to bend the curve. Next slide. So this is just a uh, schematic of when we want to treat, who we want to treat, and particularly at what stage. So again, right now we've been primarily doing tertiary prevention and really treatment trials. First in dementia, not so successful. Now moving back into MCI and very mild dementia, perhaps we're seeing some successes there. We of course all want primary prevention. We want to be able to put something in the drinking water of everybody over the age of 18 to prevent these uh, um, amyloid plaques and tau tangles from forming in the first place, but that's tough still. So I'm gonna tell you now in my last uh, 10 or 12 minutes here about secondary prevention. And what I mean here is people who have changes of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, amyloid plaque, and in some cases, even some early tau tangle buildup, but they don't yet have substantial cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's uh, disease. And our job is to try to prevent the um, memory decline and cognitive impairment. Next slide. So the first of these uh, studies, which uh, launched oh, almost eight years ago now, is called the A4 study, anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. No wonder we had to abbreviate it to A4. And this is really the first of its kind study in people who are age 65 to 85, who we did PET scans to find out if they had amyloid, but all of these people were still clinically normal, living at home. They could be worried about their memory, but they had to perform normally on memory uh, tests. And this is a phase three study, um, which in the United States is uh, governed by the uh, FDA. And it's a very long study, four and a half uh, years. And this study is in the US, Canada, Japan, and Australia. And um, we uh, enrolled over 1,150 individuals. There's two other things I won't have much time to talk about, but important studies. We also follow a group of people who didn't have evidence of elevated amyloid on their screening PET. And we also study the disclosure, what it means to people when they hear the information about their amyloid, and especially what we know and what we don't know yet about what this means for them personally. Next slide. So this is just to graphically show you, the red again is the amyloid positive curve, the blue is the amyloid negative curve. Next slide. What we're trying to do is actually bend up the amyloid positive curve towards the amyloid negative uh, curve. Next slide. And the A4 study is trying to do this over four and a half years by bending that curve up by about 30%, because that means we could prevent about half of the cases of uh, dementia if we start early enough. Next slide. 
So here I'll just show you a little bit of the results of the screening data from the A4 study, because I think these were already really important. So um, we screened about 15,000 people by telephone or on the internet. Um, over 6,700 came into um, the 67 sites. We did amyloid imaging on over 4,400 of these folks. We had predicted that 30% of them would have elevated amyloid. It turned out to be 29.5%, so that was uh, right on target. And if they had elevated amyloid, they were eligible to continue in screening, screening and then ultimately be randomized to receive solanuzumab in A4 or a placebo. And as I mentioned, if they didn't have elevated amyloid, they went into the LEARN study. Next slide. Now I'll show you just a couple of bits of data about what's different between people who have elevated amyloid and those who don't. They're very slightly older. Um, there's no difference in education. So although education is very good for helping you hide your early Alzheimer's disease, it's not protective against building up the amyloid. We also didn't see differences by sex, which is very interesting. Um, later we can talk about this, but the female increased predisposition to Alzheimer's disease with ApoE4 is likely due to tau, not amyloid. Having been married now for 33 years, I thought it was very disappointing that staying married also doesn't um, protect you. Neither does retirement, which is an early risk for dementia, but it doesn't change your likelihood of having amyloid. And of course, by definition, those with elevated amyloid had higher uh, levels. Next slide. Now, one of the things that did go with elevated amyloid is ApoE4, as I mentioned, and people who uh, have an ApoE4 uh, allele uh, were much more likely to have elevated amyloid, and about 58% of the people who had elevated amyloid uh, had an E4 allele, and that's exactly what we see in people who have Alzheimer's disease dementia. About 60 to 65% of them have an ApoE4 allele. Um, uh, yeah, in their in their family. And interestingly, although we're still looking at this, even if you account for APOE, there's still a uh, an influence of family history on amyloid status, which suggests there are many, many complex genes that may contribute. Next slide. So one of the surprises was that even though we had a very narrow range of cognition and everybody had to be uh, within the normal range, those who came in uh, and screened and were ultimately found to have elevated amyloid were performed less well on the screening tests. And these tests were done a month before their amyloid imaging. So there's no bias there. Next slide. Um, we also, uh, interestingly, heard that um, people who had uh, elevated amyloid were more likely to have said they'd had a subtle change in their cognition over the past year, even though they still perform normally, even though they're still living at home, functioning well, many of them are uh, working. Next slide. And I always like this because we looked at which specific things did people who ultimately turned out to have elevated amyloid what was different? And in blue is what the person themselves said, and in green, the study partner. So the person themselves said they had noticed the substantial memory decline over the past one year, again, even though they're still normal. But in green, the study partner was more likely to say the person had been repeating questions. And again, these are all people still living at home normal. As a clinician, unfortunately, this is one of the things you hear most from people's uh, families. And this is in people, again, who don't yet even have MCI. Next slide. So coming back to tau pet very briefly, one of the other things in A4 of us that we are obtaining tau pet imaging on a subset of individuals in A4. And here shown on the right is a picture of where in the brains and the people who screened in for A4, there's also more tau. And even though these people are normal and they're all already amyloid positive, you can see the pattern of tau accumulation that you see at the stage of Alzheimer's disease dementia beginning to build up um, in, in tau. Again, suggesting to me that this process starts much earlier than we previously thought. Next slide. Now in my last couple minutes here, I'm gonna to turn to how do we go even earlier? Because the first problem, as soon as A4 was finished enrollment, I was like, Shoo! but then immediately started to worry about is A4 early enough? 
Here is some data where we can see in red are the E4 carriers, in black are the non-E4 carriers. And what you can see is that after people start to accumulate amyloid, it's only going in one direction, going up. And that these people up in red um, who are already accumulating amyloid at 65 or 70, they must have started much earlier, even at stage at age 55. Next slide. So we started to look at all the available data sets in ADNI and ABLE from Australia, Mayo Clinic, in our own Harvard Aging Brain Study data. And we could see that about five to seven years before people got up into the amyloid positive range, they had this rapid phase of amyloid accumulation. And we thought maybe that's when we really want to be intervening. Next slide. So that led to the AHEAD study. And the AHEAD study, which is enrolling right now around the world, and I'll talk about that, has two components, two sister trials. The A3 study is finding people who have only intermediate levels of amyloid. They're not amyloid positive quite yet. And in that study, we're actually trying to look at whether we can prevent or decrease the amyloid buildup even before they're at a stage of amyloid positive. And we're also looking at tau PET. In the A4-5 study, we're looking at people who are already amyloid positive and similar to A4 saying if we can decrease the likelihood that they'll develop cognitive decline. Now, next slide. One of the differences in the A3-4-5 uh, study is, as I mentioned, we're going younger down to age 55, although if you're only 55 or 64, we look for additional risk factors. And the A3 study is this intermediate level, A4-5 is the elevated. And excitingly to me, we're testing a, an antibody called lacanumab, which you may have heard recently in the news um, because the Clarity AD study with the same uh, drug uh, showed some promising um, results in, in slowing cognitive decline in people who have very mild symptoms, MCI or very mild dementia. And that data will be presented uh, later this uh, year. But in 2019 or early 20, we chose lecanemab um, because of the phase two data looking like um, it might have a signal and also had a safety profile that seemed um, appropriate for giving it to people who didn't yet have symptoms. Now, the AHEAD study is a four-year uh, study with imaging and cognitive testing, and it's a public-private philanthropic partnership. And that's important because we make all of this data public, um, as we have with the A4 screening data already. Next slide. Now, one of the other exciting things for me in the AHEAD study is that we're actually starting targeted dosing. So in the A3 study, where people come in with lower levels of amyloid, we don't have to dose them as high. So they only get one once a month dosing or placebo. In the A4-5, where people come in with higher levels of amyloid plaque in their brains, they get the same dosing that was in the recently announced uh, Clarity study. And we do that for the first two years, and then we put everyone on a lower maintenance dose, which again is how we treat many chronic uh, diseases in medicine. Next slide. So um, if you're interested or you know people who might be interested in the AHEAD study, this is the website. Uh, in the uh, US and there are similar websites around the country because we're in a hundred sites um, around the world for this uh, study. Next slide. Since I know uh, Oxford, um, some of you may be UK uh, focused. We actually have four sites in the UK um, if any of these are need uh, nearby you. Next slide. So even though this may sound um, far-fetched that we're going to find people who don't yet have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and one day prevent dementia. I look to my um, colleagues in heart disease and to be encouraged. And it took um, 60 years um, of work actually in cholesterol to really make such a dent in uh, heart disease. First, they had to figure out how to reliably measure uh, cholesterol. And then they had to figure out LDL and HDL and, and how to fractionate it. But they started very similar um, trials to a head in A4 in people at familial hypercholesterolemia or who had high cholesterol um, and may have had uh, a small heart attack but still had good heart function. 
And those re reduction of cholesterol is actually estimated to have reduced cardiac death um, around the world, um, but especially in developed countries by 28%. And just as in the A3 trial rationale, we now treat people with normal cholesterol, but who may have an abnormal LDL. I do think that once people already have symptoms, we're going to need more than just amyloid. I'm thrilled by the potentially encouraging results from lecanemab and other antibodies right now. But I think we're going to need amyloid and tau. And next year, we'll be starting, I hope, the first combination trials as early as uh, possible. Alzheimer's disease is tough. We've been working on this and we have to be bold in uh, treating it, particularly later in the disease. Next slide. So I, my last um, uh, Mother Nature analysis, uh, analogy is, of course, a tsunami. And people often talk about Alzheimer's disease as a tsunami. But that's not a great analogy because a tsunami is a once in a lifetime event. And unfortunately, if we do nothing, Alzheimer's disease is wave after wave after wave. So we got to help these little guys in the lifeboat. And I'm hoping that's what these clinical trials will do. Next slide. I just want to acknowledge the tremendous group of people I get to work with both here at Boston at the Harvard Aging Brain Study with my colleagues at the ACTC, our uh, partners in A4 and AHEAD, and most importantly, all of the participants and their study partners without whom these studies would not be possible at all. Next slide. And um, I'm hoping you'll ask me some questions and thank you so very much for your attention. All right. Wonderful, Risa. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a that was a great overview uh, of of the work that you've been involved with, uh, and I very much enjoyed the uh, the analogies to various natural challenges. Of course, um, I mean it could be said. I think uh, you know people people make these comments about tidal waves and so forth, but it is one of the major major challenges we face as humanity going forward. As you said, it's a global global challenge. You've been doing wonderful work in the US, but all around the world as well. So um, thank you for summarizing some of that for us. Now, uh, do people have some questions for Risa? Uh, Ian's hand has gone straight up. Or finger <laughs> has gone straight up. Hello, Professor Burning. So thank you so much for your fantastic talk. Um, I've, I've been so hardened in the last four years in this field that the optimism seems to be genuinely growing compared to even two years ago. Um, and, it's, and it really leaves me feeling that uh, we have a great opportunity that, that we will have a solution by the time myself and my kids uh, get to that age. Um, but, you know, your talk leaves me wanting to start taking um, a map as soon as I'm 50, you know, to just, just take yeah. it as a, as, a, as a vaccine, as it is in some ways a vaccine. But I'm intrigued by the current state of the side effects, um, um, ARIA being sort of the primary way that we think about that. Um, but in terms of yourself, if you had a high risk individual who was 55, maybe they have ApoE4, maybe they have high cholesterol, what, where is the point that you would um, uh, be happy to deal with the risks um, because you think that, they, that they're outweighed by the benefits? Yeah. Well, the point will be when we have the data from these two trials and other trials that are starting that say the risk, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. So I'm a pretty data driven person. And even though I agree with you, I'm optimistic now seeing this, I don't think we should be um, treating asymptomatic people um, with drugs until we prove that they can really bend that curve. In terms of the risk, um, I think there are a few things to um, think about. So I've worked on ARIA, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, for a long time now, and I've been accused of calling it ARIA, something beautiful, when it uh, is obviously a dose-limiting toxicity of all monoclonal antibodies, at least those that move plaque. But I do believe that this is potentially manageable, and I think there are several ways. So one is you can potentially titrate up the dose. And secondly, I think the earlier you start, potentially the lower risk, because you have less amyloid socked into the blood vessels. And we think that really is the main reason. And of course, ApoE4 carriers are at two to three times the risk for ARIA. So we might be even more gentle in the dosing in ApoE4 carriers in asymptomatic uh, people. In a head, we do titrate the dose for everybody for this reason, hoping that we will uh, decrease it. Um, and as you said, though, eventually, when we, start when we start treating everybody at age 50, 
I suspect we'll do it with vaccines um, ultimately because it's probably too expensive and too unrealistic to give infusions to tens of millions of people. And then I think we will have to really think hard about how do we, with active immunization, control the risks of aria in asymptomatic people. But you know what, that'd be a great problem to have, uh, to be able to figure out how to do that safely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Risa. Actually, uh, related to that, you've reminded me of a point earlier in your talk. You you showed, I think, some graphs indicating that amyloid levels could perhaps reach a threshold. I think this was um, asymptomatic people, um, yeah. pre-symptomatic, that, that within about two years of reaching that threshold, people tended to convert to MCI. Was that? So that's in people who have both elevated amyloid and tau. So yeah. there are people who have elevated amyloid who they do decline, but they may never progress to dementia in their lifetime. If people have high levels of both amyloid and tau, our data so far suggests that again, within two years, um, not all, but a majority of those people are in trouble. And so for me, this was really um, the impetus to be more aggressive about anti-amyloid before there's a head full of tau as well, because I think after that, again, tau may be really driving a lot of the change, but they work synergistically. And that's one of the things we really need to continue to work on uh, as a field. Right. And, I, and I was curious if, if it was, um if it was really a threshold which was about the total amount or if there was anything to do with the distribution in the brain of, of both amyloid and tau. I mean tau more obviously because it tends to have this uh, characteristic distribution but I was particularly curious about amyloid I guess and whether or not the distribution and spatial pattern was important. So um, there are people in our group very focused on this and in the very beginning that that distribution and spatial spread may be important because it tells you who's about to really uh, move up. But by the time most people have symptoms and are, most people are accumulating a lot of tau in the neocortex, they've got amyloid almost everywhere. And there's a kind of an asymptote of how much amyloid they have. So I think the anatomy of amyloid is important 20 years before dementia, but not right before. And similarly for tau, um, I think there, is, there are a couple of points in the knots of tau that are important. So when it spreads beyond the medial temporal lobe into this catastrophe, that is clearly a, a defining moment for moving along the Alzheimer trajectory. And what is it that causes that? It's amyloid is a big factor, but it's not the only factor. APOE influences it, but there are some people who don't have a catastrophe, even with a lot of amyloid and APOE4. So that is an area of intensive research. And then there's probably a second part of tau pathology that we need to understand, which is when it goes beyond these early areas, the inferior temporal really starts to spread throughout the brain. Some of that may be related to the atypical symptoms that some people get with tau. So I, I think that is a very hot area, important area of research. Wonderful, thanks. I, yeah, I've got multiple questions I'd follow on with, but we should uh, I should open it up to the rest of the team. Go, go ahead, who would like to ask a question? Yes. Uh, Mario. Hi, and thank you for this fantastic talk. Um, my question is, uh, uh, several line of evidence uh, suggests that some neuropathological uh, process uh, age-related, uh, such as um, vascular or the limbic predominant TDP43 encephalopathy, can occur with a deep pathology and contribute to cognitive symptoms. Do you think that the potential overlapping of neuropathological processes age-related, like late uh, in the older participants to at the trials, can be a significant confounding factor in the anti-amyloid uh, clinical trials. Uh, that is an excellent uh, question, and just because of time, I took out the slides I have on vascular, but one of the areas of great interest in our group is actually the um, interaction between vascular pathology and, and amyloid because we published uh, just a couple of months ago, a terrific fellow Yao, Wendy Yao et al, uh, in Annals of Neurology um, in the setting of just a Framingham risk score, uh, hypertension, and that um, increases the rate of tau deposition. So it looks more and more like tau as a final common mm -hmm. pathway of vascular and amyloid. Now the TDP43 I'm fascinated by, 
I'll say that more and more, I think there is a ubiquitous process that causes older people to accumulate amyloid, tau, TDP43, and alpha-synuclein, and that it's actually likely the same process that is um, occurring um, that helps us um, accumulate all of these proteins. I'm, you're all frozen. I just want to make sure you can still see me and hear me. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> All right, so this um, ubiquitous um, process, I think is age related. I think it has to do with the way people are able to empty their protein garbage in the brain. And that this begins even when you're a young person with tau accumulation in the brainstem. And that amyloid shows up as being particularly tough because it's the most rapidly turned over uh, protein in the brain. So you see it accumulate. Uh, in uh, people, but I think it's part of the same process. Um, and that TDP43 is one of the later um, ones that accumulates. It Late disease where it's pure TDP43 is relatively rare before your age 85, but it absolutely contributes to cognitive decline in our trials. And of course, one of the ways we look at it is things you work on, looking at volumetric MR uh, or specialized ways, because perhaps um, we know that late uh, TDP43 is associated with atrophy. Um, but I ne we need a blood test. We need a, a PET yeah. uh, ligand that's specific to TDP43, and we don't have that yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I see Michaela seems to be lying on his side in my view. Is anyone <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, uh, maybe that maybe you would want to get attention. Do you want to ask a question? I mean, um, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your talk. Um, one question I I I can ask is um, in the placebo group, those subjects that remain asymptomatic um, over the duration of the trial, um, is that a problem for the for the cognitive endpoint, or is that is that accounted for? Is it is it a problem in the in the subjects that are that are taking the the, the actual drug? Is it is, is yeah. that um, yeah? Yes. Is that accounted so, for? Yeah. So it, it it is accounted for, but it could still be a problem because, of course, in these power calculations, you base it on other data, and we had lots of data from. Harvard Aging Brain Study, ADNI, Mayo, we looked at all of these to do our power calculations. But if it turns out that more people than expected have low tau, or more people than expected uh, don't move, that's definitely a threat to power. There's two things that give me hope. One is that the tau PET imaging substudy actually showed more tau than we expected from other studies, probably because the people who come into clinical trials are you know, um, more motivated, stronger family history, again, lots of APOE4 carriers. Um, the second thing is the trial's four and a half years long, and it's actually close to five years long pandemic hiatus, so we have more time to see this. But of course, we had to make a guess at the time our power calculations were 575 per arm for a 30% decline, and we'll see if that's uh, appropriate. Um, everyone has the opportunity to go into open label after four and a half years, uh, and we'll also look at delayed start analyses so that even if some of these people don't change till seven years, and the longest person's been in the trial over eight years now, we might get a hint of if they're late, slow changers, we still might see something in the delayed start analyses. Thank you. Could, yeah. could I ask a quick uh, follow-up? Yeah. On that point, so um, how how long can the open label extension continue? Given given that I appreciate you know five years is a long trial, but you also talked about you know needing to look at a 15 year or 20 year yep. window in some cases. So what so, are the, the kind of practicalities of that? Yeah. So the A4 study, the open label again, the longest person's been in there almost three years now. Um, but relatively few because in the beginning enrollment was uh, only at a couple sites and then exploded at the end. Um, if the double blind results are, are positive in A4 and that will report out in spring of next year, 2023, 
we hope we'll continue the open label um, definitely through the time that hopefully we go to the FDA and ask for approval. And hopefully we'll be able to follow some of these people in a registry after that. If the trial is not positive in the double blind, this is something we're actively discussing. Can we still follow some of these people in some way? It is a public-private partnership, but certainly um, our partner, Lily, if the trial is, is not positive, we will stop infusions. Um, so I think we'll have to see, but I, I think if we don't see anything within four and a half years, it's unlikely we're on the right track. If we see some movement, but it's just not powered well enough, that's where a lot of discussion will happen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sibirling, for that uh, discussion. I have a couple of questions, but I'll probably just keep it to one. Uh, firstly, I was catching up on your paper where you talked about the design of the A3, A45 study, and you talk about some of the challenges of recruiting and identifying asymptomatic 55-year-olds. I was just wondering if you could just expand a little bit more on some of those challenges, and, and as you're going through the study right now, have you been managed to overcome some of them? Perhaps? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that because one of the things I didn't uh, talk much about because of time was the introduction of plasma screening into a head. So starting last fall, we did a pilot study where we looked um, first at about 650 people and now 1,200 individuals who we screened with amyloid PET, but we had blood before uh, they um, had their PET. And um, we're able first to look at uh, a beta 4240 and the um, area under the curve or the, uh, that was a 0.85. And I'll say now, because you'll get a chance to see it in CTAD, when you add um, phosphotel 217 to that, you can get an AUC that exceeds 0.95. So we can really predict pretty well, and that's 20 centaloids, above 20 centaloids of amyloid, so the A3. So these blood tests, are remarkably good at telling you who's got elevated amyloid. And we'll also present data uh, that they also tell you at least something about how much tau is there. It's not as good as its amyloid prediction, but it relates to tau. And we think it probably predicts uh, who will get more tau over time as well. Mm -hmm. So that's made our job a lot easier because now we could screen with blood tests in the community. A uh, simple blood test that people wouldn't have to come into the site. Um, that's been very important in our goals to increase diversity um, because I think we want to make sure we're reaching people out in the community who might not want to come in uh, right away to a, uh, a large medical center. And I think blood tests uh, that can be done in someone's home or a local lab or a drugstore is the way we get there. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And again, I was a skeptic, I have to say, that blood tests would be this good at an asymptomatic stage of disease, but they're pretty good. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I was going to ask one more question, Stephen, because you know I'm, I'm a little bit greedy, but maybe perhaps I can do. Uh, I was also, as part of my read up and catch up on your on your paper, I noticed you, you shared some jack curves. And I was just wondering what the jack curves would look like if they just focused on one region of the brain, for example, like the medial temporal cortex. So the um, the tau in the medial uh, temporal lobe, you mean, or do you mean in atrophy? Or in atrophy. Oh, well, yeah. All of it, right, right across yeah. all, all of it. <laughs> so the tau, you know, builds up early. It starts building up in your 50s in uh, the medial temporal lobe, particularly in the entorhinal cortex. And everyone always calls that age-related tau, but it still correlates with amyloid load, at least in A4, at about 0.4. So it's maybe age-related, but it's also telling you these people are accumulating other proteins. Now, the atrophy, I think uh, you guys are truly experts in this, but I'll say that one of the things that is, is problematic with atrophy is that there are multiple contribu contributions. So certainly tau is related. Tau predicts the amount of atrophy you'll have over the next couple of years. Vascular disease, though, interacts with amyloid and tau, um, perhaps through TDP43 late, as was already asked about. Um, and then there's this interesting issue of reserve that we haven't talked about or resilience. So not so much in the entorhinal cortex, but the rest of the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, and um, some people have big hippocampi and some people have less, and that does relate to 
educational factors, social determinants of health. So I like to think of atrophy as kind of the sum total of uh, the experiences you've had to build up reserve, as well as the hits you've had, uh, Alzheimer's disease, vascular, um, other proteins. And so I think it's a very good indicator of what's happening in your brain in terms of neuronal health. But I think it is not um, specific to any one of these uh, pathologies. And then last, related to atrophy, not just in the medial temporal lobe, but as you may, I'm sure you've noted, that many of these clinical trials have shown a paradoxical increase in atrophy associated especially with amyloid removal. And we know that that can increase the um, uh, ventricular size, as Nick Fox says, <laughs> hydrocephalus-associated uh, treatment. And this is particularly an issue because it expands the temporal lobe horn. And so this is something that we are very actively working on. We'll come to you guys for more help, I suspect, um, because if we're looking at change in tau over time, but we're in those regions, but we're actively removing amyloid and expanding the ventricles there, that makes it challenging. And I think this may be very important as we go earlier and earlier to disambiguate that. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Sperling. I'm sure we'll be happy to help. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks, Risa. So, yes, actually, um, we are experts in in MRI imaging, image analysis. I should say that I started out in neuropathology, so I started out in uh, mainly using histology and looking at a looking through the microscope in the lab uh, in a hospital. Um, uh, and 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 a big part, as you know, of, of what we do, of course, is trying to evolve the MRI contribution to this discussion. As you as you've said, you know, atrophy, I think, has a, a big part to play. But to my mind, having spent all that time looking through the microscope, we wanted some microstructure information. And uh, so we also look at diffusion imaging a lot uh, in the cortex, uh, which we find to be uh, you know, very useful. And, and I think to, to give insight into different changes that may be happening at a quite a subtle level before atrophy, before the cumulative effect that emerges as atrophy or indeed ventricular enlargement. Um, uh, I, I also spent uh, some time in my PhD, carefully studying the the, the enlargement of the of, of the temporal horn. By the way, um, so I know it well. But um, what do you think is the place potentially for new uh, biomarkers in in imaging? Because we've talked about, you've mentioned, you know, impressive results with blood tests and so forth. Uh, do you see still a place for 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 the MRI analysis and novel approaches to that? I do. Um... What I really think we need and whether it will come from MRI, so as you may know, I spent a lot of my early career in functional MRI trying to, right. what we need is something that tells us the brain is working better or not when we suck out all the amyloid or the tau. And whether that's diffusion imaging, because it's telling you about um, communication uh, through these pathways, whether there's some functional MRI that's less noisy, I haven't seen it yet, whether it's synaptic imaging, which we're working hard on. I think the SV2A is not specific enough, but there's newer agents. Um, I do think that is something we need. So we're working on smartphone testing with cognition at learning curves, because maybe that's one of the ways we can pick it up. But boy, if we could pick it up with imaging before we can see any hint of a cognitive change, that's what we need. Because now we've got biologically active molecules but our trials can't take four or five years. We need to be able to tell in a very short time if we're making the brain work better or not. And I do think that imaging or better cognitive tests are what's needed to kind of say, yep, this is in the right direction. And then you can follow a subset of people clinically longer, but you don't have to have these giant long trials like I run, because that's just not practical forever. Yeah, yeah. yes, I, I mean, I, I agree with all of that and I actually, thinking of your point about uh, plasticity and reserve or well, reserve you said but I, I i sort of link these things together somewhat yeah I, you I know agree. i think there's a there's a huge story yet to be told and yet to yet to be explored really in terms of how we can try to quantify uh that aspect of things i i, I have the feeling that functional maybe functional imaging functional measures could be part of that as you say this it's, it's a problem in terms of uh, the noisiness of some of those sorts of measures um, uh, and I also agree connectedness. I mean, we use diffusion imaging actually not not just to look at, at the connections of, of tracts, but 
to look at the cellular organization, in particular, yeah. it's the, co the, the columnar organization in the cortex that, that I've focused on for many years. And those are, you know, those are sort of integral microcircuits. You know, the, the, they, they, those, those cells are firing together. They, they kind of create, they are ensembles of cells that, that I think potentially reflect the degree to which uh, a brain region has developed and expanded. Um, but also there's the, a sort of the kind of connectivity there, the fact that the arborization of dendrites is more complex, resulting in more sort of distributed spacing of cells uh, in, in heteromodal association cortex, for example, and the, and the relative vulnerabilities of these regions. I think that we might be able to get a handle on it with some of this microstructural imaging. That's, that's what I hope. That would be fantastic. And again, hopefully some of the imaging in these longitudinal studies, you can, again, if you could see and early effect on this um, microstructure that predicts what will happen later. That's what we all need. Um, you know, one of the challenges um, is that how much imaging can we do across 70 or 100 sites? Not everybody has, we did require a 3T for uh, A4 and a head, but not everybody had all of the software for doing all of these really mm. cool sequences. Um, but I hope in the future, we will be able to add sub studies with um, more advanced imaging uh, and be able to look at this. But again, part of the goal of these public-private partnerships is to make all these data available so that smart groups like yours can look at them and, and help us develop better measures for the next trial. And agreed, we, we need robust met methods that you can use and get, ac get access to. That's, that's absolutely fundamental. And any follow-on questions? Right, Jed, yes. Yeah, that, that was a really clear answer about the role of imaging um, as an endpoint. I, I just wanted to ask a follow up about the role potentially for imaging um, earlier on to predict perhaps who might be more likely at risk of ARIA. Um, could you say your uh -huh. thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, well, I thought you were going to say predict who will decline, which I think imaging can do. But predicting ARIA is a very hot uh, area for sure. You know, we can predict it pretty well with APOE and amyloid load because you can tell people have a lot of amyloid, especially in certain parts of the brain, have a lot of CAA. And that's the best predictor dose and uh, APOE4. But if we could develop um, a measure that kind of said someone is at risk in the very beginning, like after the first titration dose, before they actually see it, that would potentially be useful as well. In APOE4 homozygotes, who are particularly high risk, uh, I agree that's uh, valuable. And again, we have a lot of those images uh, uh, in people before they uh, get a uh, drug and actually I think we have our first MR post um, uh, dosing, though, is at three months. So we probably don't have the one you need, which might be at one month after a single dose. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I really appreciate you guys um, having me. And uh, hopefully yes, thank you. this will thank be. Thank you, Risa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, think, I think we're at the top of the hour. So I, 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 it just remains for me to say thank you so much for sparing time uh, in your busy schedule. And of course, I'm sure all sorts of people are clamoring for your attention in the build up to CTAD and so forth. So uh, thanks very much. I hope we'll see you there. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending today. Great. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye bye. Thanks.